A sailor from 6 to 60, Martin Daly. Born 20th of September 1944 on Woodford Street, Newtown, Port of Spain, Martin was raised by a single parent, his mother, Celia Daly. I grew up in extremely modest circumstances, and I think it was beyond, uh, my mother was a single parent, I think it was beyond her wildest expectation that she could ever afford to send me abroad to do anything. I think the limits of her ambition at one time would I join any public service and have a safe job. But things worked out and I went in on a small budget. But Martin doesn't believe in the stereotype of the single parent. He recalls that his mother, who worked at Stephen and Todd in the book department, was a simple yet complex character. That she was a very strong-willed individual and hated to see injustices against anyone. She was a closet union organizer, um, which is a, a very interesting story because she had a very, very strong sense of justice, or injustice as you prefer. Along with his aunt Lorna Daly, a teacher at Bishop Zancy High School who was responsible for Martin's education, Martin says he had a happy childhood. I lived with my mother and aunt who was a teacher. My mother was more about my development other than my education. Of course she understood its importance, but my aunt kind of was more involved in keeping me on the straight and narrow as far as education was concerned. I would say they were both a tremendous influence in my going into law. The Queen's Park Savannah was his backyard when he recalls the football and cricket games he played there. His other heroes were Sir Constantine and Geoffrey Stolmeyer, the famous cricketers. From an early age, his mother exposed him to carnival and remembers poking fun at her arguing that Sparrow was a better Calypsonian than Kitchener, whom his mother adored. He was very broad-minded, and Kitchener, we used to have, I used to tease her by telling her Sparrow was better than Kitchener, and Kitchener was like God. Kitchener and Larry Constantine were two people that she admired enormously. Um, and I suppose that's why I got to like Carnival, because although she was not active in it, if a band passed near the house, she would grab me and we would go down the road and um, I could tell you many funny stories about carnival escapades under her care, but she was a, that, that was, well that's a bit about her, she was a very complex character, very simple, but in some ways, but very complex in others. But this kind of robust, robustness and speak in your mind and so on, that is how I do it. If a carnival band passed in front of their home, she would grab him and they would go jumping up in the band. He even remembers going to St. James during the Jose celebrations so that young Martin grew up not seeing color or class. He credits these two strong women with the choices and successes in his life. Martin attended a preparatory school on Cipriani Boulevard, the junior school to St. Mary's College, which he attended from September 1957 to 1963. Martin reconnects life at St. Mary's College and his love for debating which led him to win the first island debating competition sponsored by the JCs. Since 1962, in fact, I knew him then at what was the first independence youth speaking contest, which was sponsored by the JCs, I think. And um, he represented St. Mary's and I represented Bishop's High School, Tobago. And um, as it turned out, Fortunately for him, probably unfortunately for me, he came first and I came second. So I knew him since then. And, um, you know, he was evidently a great debater. Um, you know, it became quite clear from those days in 1962. I had won the, 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 the junior chamber had a independence youth speaking competition. I went up against some very distinguished company, but again by a extraordinary quirk of fate, I, I was able to win that and I suppose that just propelled me more and more into the whole business of talking for a living. On entering the lower sixth form, he met a teacher who would change the course of his life, Father Roland Kennel. The good part about St. Mary's College for me was I stumbled into the sixth form because in those days if you got a grade one certificate you went into the sixth form. I stumbled into the sixth form and there I met a man called Roland Kennel who was a Trinidadian, a priest, probably the brightest man I've ever met but not bright in the sense of just passing exams although he doesn't, I mean he has a tremendous academic record. 
but bright in terms of the capacity of his mind. He is, I, I, I suppose it's like the panel. You could talk about Roland Canal, that would be an interview of three or four hours. He was an incredible teacher. And he woke something up in me that I think might have lain dormant if I had not been fortunate enough to meet him. Upon completion of his exams, Martin then left to study in England at the London School of Economics and then on to Gray's Inn to study law. There he was honored with the prestigious Othwart Award in 1966. Martin speaks about his time in London and why he studied law. I went into law simply because when I was at school, I liked debating. And so the natural thing was, if you were a good debater or a good speaker, I also incidentally did some acting. Um, but the, the general feeling was that if you could speak a lot or speak well and you're interested in debating, that was a natural thing for you to do. Martin was called to the bar on the 22nd of November, 1967. He was now a practicing attorney. Martin was also a pupil and barrister at the Magic Circle Chambers of Michael Kerr QC, who later became a Court of Appeal judge. After his return to Trinidad, Martin worked with Edmund Hamill Wells QC. I first got to know Martin daily in 1971, um, when he did a matter for me in the High Court with respect to a medical insurance claim that I had. Um, that was being refused by the insurance company. And after that, I got to know him very, very well when I joined Republic Bank in 1977. And I did industrial relations work for the bank. And he was the bank's legal advisor in this field. And we worked for over 20 years together in that area of operations. And uh, that's when I grew very friendly with him. And we remained very friendly until this day. On the 31st of October, 1979, at the age of just 35, Martin Daly was appointed senior counsel for the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the youngest appointment in the Caribbean. Well, he brought a very independent view to matters that came up. And he's, uh, he's someone that thinks outside of the box. He is not restricted by the traditional opinions and by the traditional um, value set that so many people have taken on. He, he is prepared to go outside of that to look for solutions and to offer advice and to, and to get his point of view across. This appointment meant that the appointee was recognized by the law chamber as an outstanding advocate before the courts. Martin is the senior partner of the law firm M.G. Daly & Partners, which he began on January 1, 1987. His practice as an attorney is extensive in virtually every field of civil law, including Her Majesty's Privy Council London and a large industrial court practice. Martin was appointed temporarily as a Supreme Court judge from October 1980 to December 1980. Like one of his heroes, Jeffrey Stallmeyer, Martin Daly was appointed as an independent senator of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago in 1992 by the then President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, His Excellency Noor Hassan Ali. Martin was also appointed in November 1995 and in January 2001 by President A.N.R. Robinson. This appointment was made at the president's discretion, quote, from outstanding persons from major fields of endeavor, unquote. Always outspoken, Martin says his appointment as a senator did not silence his tongue on critical issues, nor was he concerned that he would be aligned to any one political party. I had no fear that people would try to, or see me as tied to any political party. All my life, because I've been fairly noisy, um, people are always trying to discern which camp I'm in. People don't seem to accept very easily in Trinidad that you can actually be what the English football commentators sometimes refer to as a neutral. I was always outspoken. Um, so to me, going in the Senate and saying what I thought, subject to the parliamentary rules, wasn't a problem. I really didn't have any particular expectations. I expected the Senate to be a place where the debate would be 
well, more dignified, for want of a better word, would focus more on issues and less on personalities, less on crosstalk. And I'm happy to say that most of the time I was there, that was true. During his service as an independent senator, Mr. Daly became well known for his successful promotion of independently crafted amendments to legislation introduced by different governments. He took a keen interest in foreign investor accountability to the host nations. He also did substantial committee work in and out of Parliament as a member of the Joint Select Committee of Parliament on the Constitution Amendment Bill relative to the Police Service, 1994, as a member of the Joint Select Committee of Parliament on the Companies Act and Security Industries Act, 1995, as a member of a Committee of Parliament to examine and make recommendations for amendments to legislation for the regulation of the tourism industry, 1997 chairman and representative of the Ministry of Industry, Enterprise and Tourism on a cabinet appointed committee reviewing aspects of company and labor law legislation and bank interest rate regulations, which reported on the 29th of June, 1989. Martin was always very principled about accountability of government spending. In 1999, he spoke out about this issue, but also wrote, quote, the contracts are juicier the contracts are fewer and far between. Whatever this government says, they have definitely widened the gap between the Mercedes-Benz cars and the rest of us." End quote. He remarks how ironic it is that the same issues now plague our nation with the Unicot scandal. I did have a big advantage in that being on the board of a bank is a very special privilege. It's not a privilege in the sense of free lunches and glasses of wine. It's a privilege in the sense that you get to sit with a lot of fine minds and you learn a lot about corporate governance. And corporate governance is easily applied with one or two modifications to governance in the broad sense. I d that was a big advantage. Um, but I always had a strong position on the need for government, who was such a big player in the economy, to always account for deals. And I use the word deals all the time. And I think if, if you look back at my speeches and my interest in the Senate, I was always hammering away at accountability and the need for accountability for government deals. I proposed many times that every time the government entered into a deal, for example, for a, 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 a methanol plant or whatever it was, that they should provide an executive summary to the parliament of what was the deal. I didn't suggest that the parliament should debate the terms of the deal. I recognize that the executive, having been elected, had a, had, had a lot of, um, well, they had the final say over what was done. But I always felt that they should have an executive summary of the deal. And I was always wary and spoke out very strongly against the government not accounting. And um, I look back at some of the things I said, and really things that I said in the late 90s apply very much to all that is unfolding about Unicot now. And I, I always had a problem with people having the ability to spend taxpayers' money without their, without arrangements for them being directly accountable to the parliament. I never bought into this thing that the state enterprise would report to the minister and the minister would report to the parliament. I never bought into that. As a senator, Martin spoke his mind and received thumbs up from all three newspapers on his contribution in the Senate. Martin is also a journalist and writes a weekly column in the Sunday Express. He was voted president of the Law Association in 2008. In 2009, the Law Association brought a no-confidence motion against the former Attorney General, John Jeremy. The issue took on a personal turn when Martin Daly was said to have coerced the vote. But as Martin explains, he was doing exactly what the laws of the Law Association warranted, and he tried his endeavor best to be diplomatic in the situation. The Law Association is a very democratic organization. Um, its constitution, in inverted commas, is basically set out in the Legal Profession Act. And like any other club or organization, if a specified number of members require the council of the association to call a general meeting, it has no choice. And so the genesis of the no-confidence motion was correspondence between the Attorney General in his first manifestation and the then Director of Public Prosecutions, 
I don't remember the requisite number of members, it might be 25 or 30, sent a letter to the council requesting a meeting, and the meeting was held. It was mandatory to hold the meeting. I suppose um, people acting out of malice or, or political motivation try to make it look as though the council was responsible for this. The council wasn't responsible for this. The council had no choice. The members requested a meeting. We put on the meeting. I was the neutral chairman of the meeting, and the vote went a certain way. But so it is not. It's not. I, I didn't consider it any kind of personal crisis or any kind of that I had any personal input. My duty was to carry out the constitution, the provisions of the constitution the, of the law association contained in the Legal Profession Act, and hold a meeting in accordance with the wishes of the members. They chose to vote a certain way. He adds, "Do not confuse what I do with who I am." Martin is a dedicated family man and says that he has two loves. The first, his lovely wife, Kavita, his soulmate. He's my friend, my companion, my housemate, my husband, my lining partner. And I always stress to him he's fiercely independent. Mm -hmm. Asked an opinion, he's able to put himself outside of a situation, listen carefully, and give you his opinion. And the second is Pam. Martin is a great lover of Pan. Anyone who needs to know where any Pan activity is taking place, calling Pan Shambago is an alternative option. Call Martin. He will tell you date, time, and place for any Pan activity in Trinidad. Whether it be Pan is beautiful, Pan down memory lane, Pan in the 21st century, all stages of panorama, any form of pan, Martin knows. When Martin is a wrong pan, he is a happy, happy person. Right? Martin just wants to be a wrong pan. Martin and Kavita have been married for six years, but were friends much longer. He can tell you what is on the calendar of pan events, but laments that the pan and the pan yard are not used as social development tools. He blames persons in governmental agencies who think that the steel ban is just a seasonal pastime and don't value the structure it can bring to our society. There is everything in the steel ban movement that makes it a perfect engine for social development. There is complaint that children are not subject to a hierarchical organization and in particular they don't get enough male supervision, they don't get enough, figuratively speaking, hammering by males. A, any Pan side that you care to name is very hierarchical, almost hierarchical to a fault. It's nearly always led by men. Men are nearly always the disciplinarians. It attracts huge numbers of young people from six upward, lots and lots of young women. Um, it has all of the ingredients to be a home away from home. Martin is also passionate about football and tennis. He was a junior tennis champion. He says he has residency in no other part of the world and so has a real stake in Trinidad and Tobago. He prefers to blossom where he is planted. I have this very strong feeling that you have to do service, but not in this rather pompous thing about, you know, to whom much is given. I, I, that's not it. Something that has to come from inside. And I have no papers for any other country, so I have a real stake when they, when they messing up this place. I have a real stake. I don't have papers for anywhere. Martin Daly would like to be remembered as being normal. He quips, work interferes with life, but it is a necessary evil. I am a Trinidadian, or Trinbagonian, because we can never leave out Tobago. I have absolutely no identity crisis. Um, and I mention that because I think part of our problem is that so many people have identity crisis in one form or another. I, I've, had a, uh, I've had a very interesting life, and hopefully it's not over, but I am 100% Trinidadian. I like Pan, I like Tassa, I have been to the oldest Ram Leela. There's nothing that goes on in Trinidad that I don't follow and, 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 and feel appreciation for. So that's all I could tell you about who is Martin Daly. Yes, I have a sharp tongue, yes, I have strong views, yes, I have many faults, um, but that is who I am, I am a Trinidadian. Often modest, he downplays his incredible success. 
One could say he's a sailor from 6 to 60. Uh, he's made a tremendous contribution to our society, um, both in the legal field and um, the, the, the um, political field, and also, of course, as a journalist, we all know now he, does a, he writes a, a Sunday column, which I read all the time, and I find very refreshing. So I would tell him that, look, you know, congratulations, and you've done a job well. And I will also suggest to him that, you know, he should continue doing that sort of thing and making his contribution because the society needs people like that and, you know, our better sons and daughters to, you know, sort of um, continue blazing the trail and continue making a contribution because if we don't have that, we will never develop. And, 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 and the point is, it is not because he's controversial at times in the sense that he doesn't always say the things that people want to hear or those in authority would want to hear that you're going to say, you know, he should shut up or <laughs> you know, sh close shop and go away. The point is that is precisely why he should be around, you know, to, to bring new ideas, give us new things to think about and so on. Martin Daly, an outstanding citizen of Trinidad and Tobago and an outstanding parliamentary personality.